Welcome to the Suicide Prevention Show here on 1360 WLBK, a weekly show that tries to shed a little light on the darkness of suicide. With us, as always, Citizen Mike. How are you doing, sir? Great to be here. Tamara Sutton, all the way from the great state of Michigan. Tamara? Always a pleasure to be with you. And Chuck Seabrass, uh, having some tests done, to All our hopes and prayers are with Chuck, yes. and we'll be uh, visiting with him very soon. But we have a very special guest in the studio with us today, Susie Piasecki. And Susie, welcome to the show. Now, you made a, recently made a presentation at the SPS Walkathon. And I wonder if, Susie, if you could please, uh, t- before you tell us your story, uh, Tamara wanted to add something. Tamara, what do you have for us? Well, I, I wanted to chat with um, us today about um, the idea of suffering and, and the challenges, the many challenges that are brought to us in life and how we view those challenges, how we meet them head on, and rather than running and hiding, to, to really um, meet them, uh, learn from them, choose to use them, and grow from them. And Susie, we are so happy to have you with us today because one of the things that is very important to us is that uh, there are so many stories of recovery out there, and you certainly are one of those, and we'd, we'd love to hear your story and, and thoughts about what you've been through. And I also want to say that I, I'm truly honored that you're the first guest on our show uh, to be able to do this and uh, how, how much courage it takes to be able to share that space with other people, and uh, that I'm very honored to be here with you. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Well, uh, just as a brief introduction, um, I'm a student over at Elmhurst College, going to be graduating this May. Um, (laughs) Woohoo! My job, I work as an inner own voice coordinator at NAMI DuPage. Um, Inner own voice is basically a recovery education program for consumers, um, basically to share their stories of living successfully with a mental illness. Um, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, so um, it's a great organization. I'm so glad I can, I'm very lucky to be working with them. Um, They basically provide support education and advocacy for consumers, that's people with mental illness, uh, and their families. So um, there's a real need for the organization, and if you wanted to check out more information, um, it's www.nami.org, N-A-M-I.org. But my story is uh, basically in the format of the NAMI Inner Own Voice program, where there's dark days, acceptance, treatment, coping skills, and then success is hopes and dreams. So the story follows those four guidelines, or I'm sorry, the five guidelines. Um, my dark days began at Western Illinois University. That's when I was, um, I received a scholarship to go play soccer there. Mm. And I was doing really well um, on and off the field, good grades, um, getting lots of awards for soccer. Uh, freshman year, I was the MVP and I received the coach's purple and gold award. Uh, those were the our school colors, purple and gold. Um, Sophomore year, co-captain of the team. Junior year, conference player of the week and school player of the week. So I was doing really well. But um, uh, one day, my junior year of college, my mom called me from home, and she basically called to tell me that my birth mother had contacted me. Um, So I always thought after graduation and uh, after I got a job and started my life that I would seek out my birth mother, that I would be the one to find her. So it was just It was so surprising to me, it was so overwhelming, it threw me into a full-blown mania for the next seven days. So um, showing classic manic symptoms, I was talking all the time, um, barely ate or slept the the whole week. I had one bagel and one apple and four hours of sleep total. Um, And I I thought everything had really deep and profound meaning, um, didn't really make sense when I was talking. and eventually, after that week-long mania, I did crash, and it was very scary because I was um, regressing into a five-year-old child, and I always thought, oh, regression's a bunch of, you know, BS. It's just in their head. They want attention. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not real. But now I know for sure it is real because it happened to me. Um, I had an uncle who forcefully took advantage of me when I was five years old, and I was reliving all of it. Um, I used to always think, well, if I just forget about it, it's, it's like it never really even happened, then I don't have to deal with it. Um, so I used to always run away from that. But um, fortunately, unfortunately, it, it caught up with me. Um, but fortunately, I was hospitalized and got some help um, right at that point. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And after my hospitalization there, um, I thought I was going to be able to go back to school, get on with the rest of my life, um, you know, graduate, get my job. But... Um, I found out my coach had a team meeting, and she told everybody there that I have bipolar disorder. So for the next, uh, basically, 
it's not a good idea to tell 18, 19, and 20 year old women um, something like this. It's a feeding frenzy for gossip. So oh, everyone adds to the challenge that you're already. Oh facing. right, absolutely, absolutely. And um, the stigma was like a brick wall. It just completely. Uh, it was just unbelievable. Everyone that I turned to, who I thought was a friend, would literally get up and walk away. And if they yeah. couldn't get up and leave, like if we were at soccer practice or at, in class, mm -hmm. they would just make fun of me. Mm. Um, or if Susie, they didn't you said feel... this was in 19... No, uh, 1999. Yeah, December right. of 99. Um, but just really, if they, if they weren't making fun of me, they were completely ignoring me. And um, I, there was just so much rejection and so much stigma. The, the only thing I could do to really deal with that was to, um, to self-medicate. Like a lot of people, um, uh, that, that happens to a lot of people, um, self-medicating with either alcohol or drugs. Well, I'm not a big drinker, but I was turning a lot to marijuana. And um, it got to the point where I was smoking so much that um, I was almost smoking every single day, sometimes several times in one day, um, even to the point where I really didn't care. In broad daylight, I was standing out in the parking mm -hmm. lot of the, dorm of the dormitory that I lived in, and... I, I was smoking up right there. Uh, I didn't care if a police officer caught me because of the fact that I just wanted to feel better for five minutes. I didn't care what oh, it was wow. just to numb the pain, just to get away from it all. Um, you know, but of course, after those highs, I'd come down even further and just you know, feel more depressed, more anxious, worthless, helpless, hopeless, insecure, uh, isolated, afraid. Y you get the idea. Just really um, overwhelmed by all these negative feelings. And um, it got to the point where... Um, I believed everybody was right, you know, oh, just, wow. um, you know, I'm a joke, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, I'm pathetic, I'm a psycho, I'm worthless. And that's, that was my darkest day because um, I had decided to overdose on the medication I was given to treat my disorder. Um, and, and it was really uh, the hardest time that I've ever really dealt with in my life. Susie, did you during that, that time at all either seek out or have someone who would listen um, well, I had a counselor at the time, um, and she was very helpful, but it's, um, there's only so much that could have been done at the time. Um, the, the environment I was in was really unhealthy to, to facilitate any kind of healing. Um, so even though there was that safe refuge with my therapist, you know, for an hour or whatever it was, I'd always have to come back to reality, and it was a really difficult situation. For me, part of that reality is people uh, taking uh, control and imposing themselves on your life instead of allowing you to express yourself. So your birth mother was imposing herself on your life. Your coach was imposing herself on your life. Your teammates were imposing themselves on your life. And many of them were doing that out of total ignorance, not knowing what the effect had on you. And in this particular case, for me, it, it's so troubling to hear this type of story because people do this to other people and it nearly cost you your life. Yeah, it, it's kind of ridiculous how ignorant people are. Yes. But, um, you know, fortunately, I, I don't know, with, with God's help, I'm still here and there's a reason why I went through all that. Um, I really believe that if I didn't go through all those things, I wouldn't be doing things like, uh, you yes. know, speaking today. Yeah and hopefully reaching one person who's listening yeah. out there. And I, again, I, I'm honored I, and I appreciate your courage to be able to, I mean, you're, you're not sitting here talking about a pseudo person. You've told us your name, you've told us where you work, you told us where you went to school, and then you also described how you were treated and you're talking about some very intimate pieces of, about your life, things that people go 40, 50 years their entire lives without saying anything aloud, and you're doing that here live with and us. again, and, so, yeah, and that's I mean, why that's we're just, doing this show. And awesome. um, if you. I can ask Susie, and again, I think this is something people want to know, and I've only learned this since we've done the a suicide prevention show, that at the moment that you said you've decided to over-medicate over yourself, was there a sense of calm? Was there a sense of, uh, were you, did you uh, find yourself at peace knowing that you were going to attempt to do this act? Um, it was really just out of anger. I was so fed up with everything, um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't cope with it anymore. So I figured this was... Um, the way, the way that I could uh, take care of everything, you know, life's not worth living. So, what's the point anyway? And then I took the medication. Um, at that point, I was just like, well, you know, I'm just waiting. It's a matter of time. 
One of the things I want to encourage us to do is to allow uh, Susie to tell her story before we start sure. jumping in mm-hmm. with questions. They're very important questions, and I know that our listening audience wants to know. I know that those of us here you know, that are honored by your presence and just responding to you really want to know. And I also know that's one of the messages we're trying to send, speak up instead of remain silent. Flip side of the coin for the, the sake of programming and being able to air it and being able to allow you to tell the fullness of your story right now. I'm going to ask that we allow you to do that. Then you'll take a sure. break and then we can come back and, and talk about it in closer detail. Okay. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, well, uh, those were the darkest days, uh, as I had mentioned, but um, <clears throat> acceptance didn't really, um, acceptance was very hard for me because of the fact that, you know, I had a serious problem with someone telling me there's something wrong with the way I think and I feel and I behave. Um, I think if any of, of us were told that right away, we wouldn't be like, yes, you're absolutely right. There's something wrong with me. Um, you know, nobody ever aspires to have a mental illness, but it does happen just like cancer or AIDS or, you know, what, whatever, whatever kind of illness, um, any kind of physical illness. But, um, with acceptance, I was in denial for about three years. And during that time, um, I was very non-compliant with my meds. Uh, I didn't even like taking Tylenol for a headache, so why would I want to take psychiatric medications every single day for the rest of my life? It didn't not make sense at all. I I just didn't see it happening. So um, I don't know, just swallowing the pills was swallowing my pride, and I had too much of that. So um, I tried going back to school, like I had mentioned, but um, that failed because I went off my meds and I smoked pot. Um, I went into a mania. At that time, I thought I was going to save the world, so I joined the AmeriCorps. Um, And I stayed in Florida. I was supposed to be in Florida for about a year, but then I only lasted for three months because I went off my meds, I smoked pot, and I went to a mania. Um, Let's see. At that point, I was, when I was in Florida, um, I had uh, thought I was going to be marrying a a man that was 20 years older than me that I met like a week before. But again, that's a symptom of mania, a classic symptom of hypersexuality, increased sex drive. Um... But, you know, fortunately, my family realized what was going on. Um, They knew something was wrong, so they came back down to get me, brought me back home. Um, I was very determined. I said, you know, one last time, I'm going to go back to school and get my degree. But, I, you know, when I was there, I went off my meds and I smoked pot. And instead of going into a mania this time, I was coming down from those two um, manias into a severe depression. And basically just had to withdraw from all my classes, never finished my degree in psychology, and I went home feeling like a complete failure. So um, there was a big disappointment, mm-hmm. but uh, with acceptance, the key for me was to realize that as a person with mental illness, that I'm a person first. Um, you know, I always thought with the way I was being treated that, you know, I am a disease, I am an illness, I'm, I'm something to be stayed away from. Um, it was just really difficult to um, understand that I'm just a human being. Um, Also, my family and friends were a huge support, and I know if it wasn't for them, I would not be here today, because it's the times when I had no hope, and I couldn't believe in myself. That's when they're the ones who who carried me through that. They're the ones who hoped for me. They're the ones who believed in me. So, um, also, educating myself, I thought learning about uh, famous people who have an illness, uh, mental illness, um, that kind of gave me some hope, because of the fact that um, you know, even though they have an illness, they can still succeed and contribute to this world, you know, significantly. You know, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, Vincent Van Gogh, George O'Keefe, um, let's see, lots of politicians, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, me, um, artists galore, M- Michelangelo, um, even people like Angelina Jolie, uh, a self-injurer, and uh, Princess Di, who um, was also a self-injurer and uh, had eating disorders. There's just so many people that are amazing to us in in the world's eyes um and you know what they had an illness so it's it's just that was encouraging to me um and helped me in in accepting my illness as far as treatment goes since bipolar disorder is hereditary um, i decided to write my birth mother and i asked her three different times is there any history of illness physical or mental in our in our family and all three times she said we have perfect health so um, I don't know if the translation of the letters didn't go through right or what, but uh, my doctor and I had nothing to go off of. So um, basically we just um, tried different medications left and right, but there were so many side effects. It was the perfect excuse for me to not take my medicine. So, um, you know, I felt drowsy all day, felt like a zombie, couldn't sleep at night, um, major anxiety, uh, let's see, weight gain. That's a big one for me because, you know, what woman wants to gain weight? There's uh, not many people I know that want to. Um, if, as a matter of fact, 
there's many women who take pills to lose weight. Um, so uh, another uh, set of, med of side effects from the medication, um, let's see, over easily overheated, easily dehydrated, and a significant loss of balance. Those last three side effects caused me to have to quit playing soccer, uh, which was a huge disappointment. I played for 18 years, um, and I have never gone back to it uh, since. Um, but if I stopped taking the meds, I would end up hospitalized or just very symptomatic. And um, after the overdose, I was very lucky. Not only was I living at the time, but I got a new doctor and a, a new medication that actually started to work after about two or three months. Um, at that point, I took my recovery very seriously. Um, I, I uh, stopped doing drugs, started taking my meds exactly as prescribed, uh, did everything I could to learn about the illness, went to groups and therapy regularly, um, and basically felt hopeful for the first time in years. Um, and with coping skills, uh, it's really basic stuff. I didn't realize, um, you know, s stuff that's good for everyone, eating right, getting enough sleep, uh, um, exercising. Um, I have to make sure that I eat right because uh, it doesn't have to be three square meals a day. It's just, um, you know, one good meal every single day because my brain's like any other organ in my body. If it's going to function properly, it has to have the right nutrition. And um, exercising, it doesn't have to be a two or three hour high intensity workout anymore. It's just uh, a walk around the block or uh, I like to rollerblade a lot now. So um, just something to get the blood flowing. Um, as far as sleep, it's very important. Um, nine hours of sleep is optimal but uh, for myself, but um, if I get too much sleep for too long, I can get depressed. If I get too little sleep for too long, I can get manic. So it's very important to find the balance. If I don't get that nine hours in one chunk of time, I have to take a nap and kind of compensate for it. Um, other things, music, everyone knows how therapeutic music is. It's um, just hearing a song that expresses how you feel can make, is just so healing, it's, it's so therapeutic. So I, I play guitar, um, I've led worship at uh, my, my Bible study for about four months, and I've started songwriting. Um, so that's been very helpful. I also, if there's something on my mind that I just can't stop thinking of, I journal. I always say, ink it, don't just think it. Um, because if it's, if it's on paper, it's much more objective, and I can, I can process it a lot better. And, um, you know, I always joke that shopping's a great coping skill for every woman. But, um, you know, as long as I'm not in a mania. But more seriously, um, like I had touched on earlier, my spirituality, my spirituality has definitely become a major coping skill um, just baptized in June, and uh, I'm just beginning to understand, you know, God's my rock, you know. For me, Christ is like an, 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 an unending f source of hope and light in my life, and, you know, e especially during the darkest times. So um, I'm really beginning to, to grow to appreciate that. Um, and as far as the last section of successes, hopes, and dreams, um, let's see. With, with soccer, it was nice to have all of that success. Uh, it's nice to have achieved all that, but it's not like the real success that I'm having today. Because to me, real success is speaking for NAMI, you know, doing things like this, uh, sharing my story. I think it's so worthwhile, rewarding, fulfilling. Um, it's, it's just great to be able to touch people's lives and, and help them understand that they're not alone. Um, let's see, I've, I'm also, uh, like I had mentioned, I'm back at school now. Um, I went to Wright College and I received my certificate to work as a mental health professional and now I'll be receiving my degree in psychology this May. Um, hopefully, uh, if things keep unfolding the way they have, I'll be very fortunate to have a job working as a, um, a patient advocate um, over at Good Sam. And uh, let's see, uh, my biggest accomplishment was in April of 2004. That's when I became officially certified as an EKG technician. Um, and that is important to me because, um, you know, the week before I was hired, I was in the hospital. So by the time the training and orientation came around, I, I could not concentrate whatsoever. Um, it was just very stressful. I had so much anxiety. And uh, I was only company certified. So it was important to me to be just like everybody else there and be officially certified. Um, with a little help, with some tutoring, uh, I got I got the certificate on the first try, so I celebrated with a big steak dinner on that one. Um, and as far as hopes and dreams, I hope to meet my birth mother um, later this year. For a while, I hadn't heard from her. For about a year and a half, um, we just lost contact, but um, hopefully I'll be hearing back from her soon. I told her that I'm finally, you know, emotionally and financially ready, um, and my mom and I will be able to go together. 
uh, through this program called Korean Ties from Wisconsin. Um, it's a tour, it's a personalized tour for two weeks. They have a social worker, a tour guide, and uh, a translator. And they take you to, you know, if you had lived in an orphanage, they bring you there. If you had foster parents, um, they try to reunite you. And if you're lucky enough to have birth family um, that you can contact, they bring you there and reunite you. Um, so I'm sure it'll be a great experience. Um, let's see, it, it's either going to be this J July or in October. But um, it's just, it's going to be great. So, um, and my dream is basically to completely eradicate the stigma of mental illness. You know, I, I would hope that we could find a cure. But, um, you know, at this point, we just really need to um, eradicate the stigma because it's so bad. People are afraid to talk about it. They're ashamed. They feel embarrassed. Um, that's not the way it should be. This is a brain disorder. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just like any other organ in the body. It's a brain disorder. So um, that's pretty much it. But <laughs> thanks <laughs> for listening. That's more story. than enough. I know that's an incredible. Susie uh, Piasecki uh, with her story about recovery. And uh, we have to take a quick break. We're going to come back and visit with Susie some more here on the Suicide Prevention Show here on 1360 WLBK. Every minute, someone in the United States attempts suicide. Tragically, every 18 minutes, someone succeeds. 90% of people who kill themselves suffer from a mental illness. It, it doesn't, doesn't have, have to, to be, be that, that way. way. There is hope. There is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. NAMI affiliates nationwide help individuals and families touched by mental illness. Call 1-800-346-4572 or visit our website at il.nami.org. You are, you are not, not alone. alone. The WLBK Suicide Prevention Show recently won the Silver Dome Award as the best public affairs radio program in Illinois. Some of the extraordinary people we've talked to, the first one that comes to mind is Denny Miller, a delightful guest, and really gave us an insight as to what it's like to be a coroner and have to deal with the prospect of somebody committing suicide. We had the police chief on who spoke about how really difficult that is to investigate suicide and telling families about what that's like. It's really far-reaching. Friends and family, neighbors are all so much more deeply affected than most of us realize if we haven't been touched by it ourselves. I was under the old myth that if you talk to somebody about suicide, if you actually use the word suicide, that would prompt that person to commit suicide. And, and Chuck, we've learned that's not true. It's, it's very not true. The more you talk about it, the less stigma there is, and the more comfortable the person that's having those thoughts, they feel a little more free to talk about it, open up, and, and hopefully not complete that act. Join us Sunday morning at 930 for the Suicide Prevention Show on the station that cares about its community, 1360 WLBK. Okay. Welcome back to the Suicide Prevention Show here on 1360 WLBK. We just heard a very moving uh, story from mm -hmm. Susie Piasecki uh, sharing her life story with us. And, uh, Susie, we very much appreciate that, the courage yes, thank it you. took not only to come thank into the show, uh, but do that as well, Michael. And you were talking about how this all ties in with what we ultimately talk about on the show is listening, for mm -hmm. one, which we were all just captivated by your story, yes. Susie, I might add. Uh, and then and then talking, talking yes. about suicide. Yeah. Susie mentioned and you, when you were talking, Susie, that people don't talk about these things, mm -hmm. and that's why we do this show. And we're just so honored and thrilled that you were able to come here and, and share your, your innermost feelings with us. You know, the other thing I'm struck with is that it's not just that they don't talk about it, but actually they do, and they do it in so many hurtful ways. You know, what she was talking about, the coach's response or teammate's response. You know, and, and, and I'm, I'm just, like, struck, particularly in how she's telling her story, how she owns the responsibility. And yet, at the same time, there are messages that are embedded with that, the whole piece in terms of denial. So you're talking about denying my, my mental. Let me tell you, for me, you're, you describe a story where your life changes, and all of a sudden, you come back to your life, and people are treating you very different. The whole thing in terms of being rejected, unaccepted, getting all those messages, that was not in your head. That was you, me, other people out here, the way we're treating you. And, and you're confronted with trying to get your, your, your being diagnosed with the illness and trying to get your life back under control. And the rest of us are out there just jacking it up, speaking hurtful things instead of things that could be helpful. Indeed, yes. Oh, sorry. I I think, well, Michael, that was my response. Yeah, I know. I'm using yes, my hands. So, it. Tamara, tell us a little bit about how you responded to uh, Susie's story. Well, I, Michael, thank you for that point because it is what our response um, to Susie's story, um, to my son, you know, informing yes. me that, that he doesn't belong on this yes. planet, the response that we, that we have to that can either help in some way if we're, if we're really listening, or it can add to the challenge. And they're feeling as if they are, you know, I think Susie said, 
it a couple of different ways, but feeling like there was something wrong with her mm-hmm. and, you know, that she's a crazy person or something along those lines. I know Demetrius felt that way as well, and his friends knew that he was suicidal, and some of them pulled away from him, mm-hmm. and he had that to deal with. I, you know, I guess the, the other piece of this that really strikes me is, um, I have to say, Susie, thank you so much for telling your story. You're very um, welcome. In just the way that you, you do it. What, you, what I, I'm seeing or hearing is that um, though you had, had your moments of um, denial and not wanting to look at um, you know, what was really going on for you, at some point you decided to stay with it. Mm-hmm. At some point, you decided to stay awake and to feel it and to acknowledge, okay, maybe there is something to this. And and, and somewhere you took, kind of stepped up and and decided to take responsibility and maybe even recognize that the only way that you're going to get through this is if you do something about it or with it and for yourself. It is taking ownership, um, you know, and taking responsibility for your own recovery. Um, you know, people can do so much for you, you know, only so much for you, I should say. Um, you know, your family, your friends, therapists, psychiatrists, they can all support you, but it's really up to uh, up to you to, and it's hard. It's hard to do that. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's the hardest thing. Would you agree the hardest thing you ever did in your life? Oh, uh, well, I think so. I think so. Uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I am really, as Michael has said, I'm, I, we all have our, our huge challenges in life to get through. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I just um, have to really recognize the fact that, that you took hold of it and the courage um, that mm-hmm. that took. You know, for me, that's a lot of courage, in part because when I hear you tell your story, I hear a story of a person whose life became shattered, just totally shattered. Uh, And in part, it was precipitated by your birth mother contacting you. And and we don't know the rest of it, but that's how I see it. In in a shattered world, you you survived. You worked at uh, uh, overcoming the rejection and the lack of acceptance and learning more about uh, the illness that is plaguing your body and taking control and responsibility. W- one of the things that, too, that I want you to consider reflecting on, though, is to tell us and tell our listeners, what would you like to have seen people to do differently? What do we need to know that we're so ignorant about um, being a person who suffers with a mental illness? What do we need to do differently? Um, just remember that the person... Um, is a human being that uh, just needs support. Um, you know, mental illness is not a, a casserole uh, illness, as one of my friends, Patty Johnstone, says. Um, it's not the type of illness where people will knock at your door and, you know, provide you casserole and give you sympathy. Um, I guess just really taking the time to listen, um, not leaving people, not abandoning people. Um, don't walk away, um, even if things are tough. Um, you know, just to to have an encouraging word. Um, if you don't know what to say, that's okay too. You know, if if uh, just if someone's feeling so terrible, uh, if if you're in the room at least, you know, you don't even have to say one word, but just being there with them, they they're they're not alone. So, just something as simple as that. Um, or if you did want to say something, encouraging them to, you know, seek out help if they're struggling with acceptance, or um, you know, just uh, giving words of encouragement or or praise for you know having the courage to go out and, and get the help um, if they are already seeking it. Um, there's so many really little things that um, can just make a huge difference for someone with a mental illness. And, and that's so awesome to hear because we've talked about those stories that the child that went next door that Tamara talks about sitting in the grandpa's lap and just being there while he cried, you know, and just and, and staying connected with the person even though we don't clearly understand what was going on. If we have a bit more time, the other thing I would like you to do it's we don't, I'm don't, afraid. Okay. I'm afraid we're Another quickly time. out of time. As Again, it was a fascinating talking to Susie, and obviously we want to have Susie back and reflect some more. We've learned things like casserole illness and, and think it, uh, don't think it, ink it. I love that one, uh, Susie. But I know Tamara wants to thank you for, for coming on again, Tamara. Just uh, uh, say goodbye to Susie at this point, but we're certainly going to have her back. Susie, we hope to have you back, and thank you also for really sharing such a uh, heartfelt story. You're so welcome. Yes, it'll be great to be back. Uh, Citizen Mike. As I said, I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you.
Thank you for honoring us with your life. Sure. Susie, I'm going to say one more time, Piasecki, Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much uh, for being here again and having the courage to share with us, too. And uh, I know you've touched many lives of people that have uh, been listening to this broadcast, and you will touch many more. So thank you so much. Thank you. And that's the Suicide Prevention Show for today.